Hi, good morning, everybody. My name is Dan Vicuña. I'm the National Redistricting Manager at Common Cause. Um, although I first cut my teeth in politics uh, and political advocacy working in Washington, D.C., I'm currently based in Common Cause's L.A. office. Uh, when you live in D.C., you don't have to do a lot of explaining uh, about what it means to work in this field. Um, L.A. is a slightly different story. Uh, although it's not, in fact, filled entirely with aspiring screenwriters and actors, as stereotypes would uh, imply, um, it's obviously not the world capital of politics. Uh, as a result, I often find myself uh, sort of having to explain what it is I do, kind of the basics of that uh, in various settings. Um, and sort of the, the main... Um, uh, kind of description metaphor I've come up with for working in democracy reform is that it's sort of like sailing a ship through an ocean of cynicism toward islands of inspiration. Uh, you'd be hard pressed to find a reform whose opponents are more disingenuous, more entrenched in their positions of power, or less interested in empowering we the people uh, than uh, redistricting reform. Um, uh, you know, <laughs> You know, in the past, you know, the fight to end gerrymandering is one in which that ocean of cynicism is especially vast, and those islands of inspiration have felt unreachable. Uh, but that's why it's such a pleasure to moderate this panel discussion. Uh, we have an opportunity to do some island hopping to remind us that victory is indeed within our grasp. In 2018, redistricting reform was, uh, of different varieties was on the ballot in five states, thanks to signature gathering or pressure on legislators, and it won in all five. Uh, in this hour, we'll hear stories from four of those states uh, in which years uh, and sometimes decades of advocacy met the right moment and the right activists to alter the course of American democracy. Uh, I'm joined by four activists who are here to lead us um, on our journey and discuss how they helped win important fights to end gerrymandering in their states. I'm thrilled to introduce Katie Fahey from Voters Not Politicians in Michigan. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> Everybody's got to get that applause or else it'll be just be rude. So. <laughs> Curtis Hubbard of Fair Maps, Colorado, Sean Sonker Nicholson from Clean Missouri, and Catherine Turser from our own Common Cause family in Ohio. Uh, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to give a short introduction of themselves and the reform they worked on. I'll move to some questions in roughly chronological order about the life of their campaigns. So you can hear about you know, how they dealt with some similar issues, and then I'll open up the floor to your questions. Um, but before I dive in, uh, we do have some breaking news. Is Selena Stewart here? Right there, thank you. Uh, Selena, our partner with the League of Women Voters, uh, is going to describe some exciting news out of Michigan. Um, uh, the National Redistricting Team at Common Cause, we get on the phone every couple of weeks with Selena and, and Jessica jones Caporal with League of Women Voters to talk about what's happening on reforms around the country. And it's always uh, exciting and inspiring. Um, so uh, let us know what's going on in Michigan. Come on up. So thank you very much. Um, I know the focus this, this weekend is North Carolina, so I appreciate a moment to talk about Michigan. So a little background on this case, and thank you, Dan, for that introduction. Um, the Michigan League case is a case that is the only one in the country that is challenging all the maps, so both the House and Senate state, as well as the congressional maps. So it's been a long and arduous fight. Uh, we've been in this for about a year and a half. But the November election broke the unitary government in the state. So essentially, we had some Democratic and Republican representation, which was very important. And the SOS, Secretary of State Jocelyn Benson, very early on said that she wanted to push for settlement, which was great because there was clear evidence, direct evidence of gerrymandering in the state. So after several weeks, literally, literally she got sworn in, and then she was like, OK, we need to for settlement, which was great for us. So for several weeks, we've been negotiating and doing all of these things. And settlement is rarely easy. I think, as everyone knows, you don't get everything you want. But the beauty in settlement is that it really forces you to focus on what's really important. So for us, that was the 11 House districts that is that essentially will protect hundreds of thousands of voters. So while our name is on the case, I think it's very important to focus on the fact that this is on behalf of voters. And because gerrymandering affects us all, you know, we're pleased to be a representative, but we're most pleased that we were able to help so many voters in Michigan. So I think that Karen did a great job of really outlining what this case or what this case was about, but also what we've done. So we have filed for settlement. It is still in the process, so it's not approved yet. So I have to be very careful about what I share, otherwise my attorneys are going to be calling me on the phone. <laughs> but what I will say is that we've entered a motion for settlement 
And we're very pleased about the terms within it at this time. So with that, I'll turn it back over to you and thank you so much. Uh, so as I mentioned, we're going to lead off by having each of our speakers uh, talk a couple of minutes about uh, their campaign, the reform they fought for. I'll move to some of my own questions after that and yours after that. So we'll start uh, with Katie. Hello, I'm Katie Fahey, also from Michigan. Um, so we had kind of a dual strategy going on, although both started very separately. Um, who here today is ready to end gerrymandering? Anybody? Woo! All right, good. Um, so it's super easy. You just have to hop on Facebook. You make a Facebook post that says, I'd like to take on gerrymandering in Michigan. And then it just happens. You amend the Constitution. Um, <laughs> my background was in sustainability and recycling. But the 2016 election really had me thinking about the systemic reforms that leave a lot of voters, especially in Michigan, uh, without voices. Um, I literally made a Facebook post before going to work one morning uh, that said, hey, I want to take on gerrymandering in Michigan. And it quickly exploded from there. Organizations like the League of Women Voters and, uh, and many others in our state had worked for years around education. So a lot of people already knew that this was an issue. We had some really great uh, editorial boards in the state too. So it was in the news every now and then really talking about how the way voters vote doesn't line up with the representation we had in our state. So that when I made a Facebook post, a lot of people were ready to hop on board. <laughs> we're really unique, I think. Um, we had no idea what we were doing, didn't start with a bank account, uh, <laughs> hadn't done a campaign before. But what ended up happening is we had over 14,000 volunteers across our state for over two years fight to get this not only on the ballot, but make it through the Michigan Supreme Court, which is extremely partisan, and then ultimately win with over 2.5 million yes votes on November 6th. Uh, yeah, it's been phenomenal. Um, it really goes to show we were completely people powered. We took people's uh, skills that they had and their their day jobs and uh, other life experiences and just applied them to a campaign, kind of like crowdsourcing, except not just around money. We were doing around skills, too, um, and really found a way that not only Democrats, but Republicans and independents could come together to fight for something that was just good for our state and kind of push the politics aside. And by being outsiders, I think it actually helped us, uh, advantaged us uh, to be able to take on that win and also take on a lot of other uh, assumptions about how you have to run a campaign. Thanks. Well, I can tell that this room, you, you all have had more coffee this morning than, than I have. Thank you for the, the, uh, the, 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 the cheers and the applause. I'm Curtis Hubbard from Fair Maps, Colorado. Um, our effort was, was very different uh, than, than the sort of the grassroots uh, the effort. Uh, described in Michigan. I started working on this issue in 2016, and I was um, uh, hired by a group of Democrats and progressives who wanted to fight a measure that was being put forward largely by Republicans. There were a, a handful of Democrats um, that were working on gerrymandering reform, reform um, but we saw it really as sort of an extension of the Red Map Project uh, that Republicans had been working on in 20. Uh, in 2010 uh, in that cycle, and we wanted to make sure that we kept what we thought at the time was a bad idea uh, off the ballot. We were successful then. Uh, we knew they were going to come back in 2018, and the conversation that we started to have was, well, rather than having um, their bad idea on the ballot alone, let's put good ideas and best practices together and run a competing ballot measure. Um, so Colorado was headed to uh, essentially voters. Uh, it's a referendum state. I think it's important uh, to, to point that out to you, to you now. And we have a, a deep history of that sort of direct democracy. Um, Oregon, California, Colorado are, are essentially the top three when it comes to um, citizens using um, the ballot initiative process. So we were headed to the 2018 uh, election. There were going to be four redistricting questions. Essentially, it was mutually assured destruction, right? You were going to have uh, just too much for voters um, to weigh through. And um, one of the people who became a co-chair of our, our group is the CEO of a Fortune 500 company, and he's a, uh, a, 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 a I'll call him a reformer, uh, somebody who cares very much about uh, how government works. His name is Kent Theory. He's the CEO of DeVita. And he called both sides together, and he essentially said, do you guys want to get something done? 
And the answer turned out to be yes. Uh, and it was uh, a really incredible moment because you had people from the right, people from the left, who had uh, some distrust of one another. And it took a long time to sort of bring everyone along to agree on the foundational principles uh, of what we were pursuing. We started with uh, independent commissions, was sort of the agreed upon, that was the, the best course of action for us. Uh, and then through that process over the course of almost 30 uh, negotiating meetings, we ended up with what we think really is a, a national model for redistricting reform uh, that can be used in other states. Um, uh, we owe a ton to uh, Common Cause, to the League of Women Voters, to the Brennan Center, to the Arnold Foundation, people who've been working on this issue nationally, um, who were able to look at the, the language um, that we had been working to put together to suggest best practices for us. Uh, and I think we did really end up with something um, that's going to be um, uh, helpful for Colorado moving forward. Colorado is a purple state. We have um, the, the largest group of voters in the state are now unaffiliated voters who account for about 39% of the electorate. Then it's Democrats at 35 and um, Republicans uh, at about 33. Um, so that big chunk in the middle of unaffiliated voters are, 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 have become increasingly important. They swing elections in Colorado. And what we did on our independent redistricting commission is we said this isn't just going to be six Republicans and six Democrats. It's going to be four Republicans, four Democrats, and four unaffiliated voters. Any map that's approved has to be approved by a supermajority but not just a supermajority where the Republicans and Democrats can team up, divvy up the state the way that they want to, but it's gonna require at least two votes from the unaffiliated voters there. Um, so what we've, we've done is we've really created a system that has lots of checks and balances, and as the conversation goes on, we can talk more um, about uh, what's included in there. But we ended up, uh, we thought we were gonna collect signatures to put this compromise measure on the ballot, but we decided to go to the legislature and say, we would really prefer if you all as uh, lawmakers would refer this to voters. And because we had such a strong group from the right and the left that had come together on this historic compromise, the legislature passed it 100 to nothing, uh, both measures to the ballot, and it was remarkable. Um, and it really is uh, a, a testament to what can be accomplished when people are willing to put aside their personal and partisan interests and put the interests of their state and their government first. So uh, my name is Sean, I'm from Missouri. Um, we're gonna get into, it, it, it's just fascinating to hear these stories and we've done some of these conversations a couple times during the campaigns and since then. Um, there are a lot of remarkable similarities that we'll get into across these campaigns, but we all had very, unique experiences at the same time of, of how it came about in, in each of our states. So in Missouri, we um, a number of us had been thinking about and working on how can we change a lot of the things that are broken in Jefferson City and the way Missouri politics work. And we've sort of had been living in a no limits Wild West world with money and um, very few rules and guidelines on how maps would be drawn so that um, we had a pretty dysfunctional system without any real criteria for how maps would be crafted. And um, when there was compromise um, uh, to, uh, to, ch to the point on, on Colorado, it would be a compromise from the parties where um, there's just a lot of like very safe seats and it protects specific parochial interests, specific partisan interests, uh, but voters get left out in the cold. And so what we passed after um, you know, a, a full two-year campaign, more than a year collecting signatures, uh, was a legislative reform package that included a number of ethical reforms, um, changes the way lobbying and campaign finance rules worked, um, some new transparency rules for the General Assembly, um, rules to add more independence to our state legislative redistricting process, and rules to create new criteria that uh, put voters first to make sure everyone's getting a fair shake. Um, like in Michigan, uh, we won by a two to one vote. It was pretty amazing. You can't do that kind of stuff without <coughs> legit uh, bipartisan coalition or nonpartisan coalitions that, that cut across um, you know, the way people traditionally think about politics. Um, and we'll get into this a little later that um, I think one of the real opportunities uh, that we saw and that we'll continue to see is that there are there is a lot of gridlock at a, in a, 
in Congress, in a lot of legislatures, um, but voters like, do understand some of the things that we're talking about and some of the other values about competition and um, democracy do, like those still matter even in this very weird and frustrating moment that we are in. So yeah, I look forward to talking more about that. Hey everybody. Um, so I'm Catherine from Ohio, uh, and the story of redistricting reform in Ohio is the story of failing forward. Um, I was really taken yesterday. Aaron Bird said that the people move at the speed of trust. I was really, I just, I found that really moving. Um, so Ohio had its first redistricting reform measure on the ballot in 1981. Um, as you might imagine, um, it failed. Um, and, and, you know, that story was a story in many ways of persistence, that the League of Women Voters of Ohio kept at it. So that first attempt was in 1981. We all tried again um, and tried to move it legislatively. So I st first started working on redistricting reform in the late 90s. Um, and it, and it, it was a little bit about trying to explain a conspiracy theory that was in plain sight, that was affecting us all. And yet people would say, but we're having elections. Um, so it, it was a kind of a slow process to move forward. Um, we collected signatures, a big coalition of us, in 2005. Oh, we, we, we failed. Like, we went down in flames. Um, I think we got 36% of the vote. That was in 2005. So you're going to notice some pictures behind me because uh, one of the things that made a difference is the next time we collected signatures to put redistricting reform on the ballot was in 2012. Well, we got our asses kicked. But we started moving more and more and more of a conversation so that um, redistricting reform measures every single year were actually in the legislature following that. So there were time periods where we would have a measure that was passed in the House and a measure that was passed in the Senate. They just weren't the same darn measure. So it was incredibly frustrating. It wasn't until 2015 um, that we finally addressed state legislative redistricting reform. And that's because the legislature came together and said, yes, we need to do this. We're going to create an Ohio redistricting commission. We are going to have rules. You can't draw districts to favor or disfavor one political party over the other, one candidate over the other, one incumbent over others. We were able to do that. We even had um, a rule that addresses what they call fair representation, that whole thing of like, if the state as a whole um, you know, is kind of 50-50, that in fact some districts should head left, some should head right, but that they, they should not, there shouldn't be a skew. It's just a kind of different way of measuring gerrymandering. Um, sometimes we talk about efficiency um, gaps, but that's kind of how we talked about that, and it's, an, it's in our Ohio Constitution. Because in 2015, 72% of voters came out and they approved it. Woohoo! Yes. So, so as you might imagine, you know, we gotten this far, and we really assumed that naturally, um, we passed state legislative redistricting reform. The legislature took action and made, you know, advances. Voters overwhelmingly supported it. Nothing happened on congressional redistricting reform. And so we started a campaign. We spent, we spent a year. We talked about the proposal. We did all of this work to try to get people on board. And we said, OK, we've hit a point. We just have to start collecting signatures. And when we hit 100,000 signatures, the legislature came back and said, hey, you're right. We should actually do something. Uh, you know, but as you might imagine, just um, the story of redistricting reform in Ohio, yes, we're failing forward. but the level of frustration. So if you all are, you know, in North Carolina or some other state and you're just feeling really frustrated, um, when I hear Katie talk, I'm like, that sounds like a miracle. Like, like, no, doesn't it? Like, I put a Facebook post. Like, I, you know, like that story of quickly being able to get signatures. You know, we did a lot of good activities and we laid the groundwork and it was a really long, hard fought. But in May of 2018, 75% of voters passed congressional redistricting reform. We won in every single county of Ohio, all 88. 
And so as you can see, you know, that whole notion of people, you know, move forward at the speed of trust, it took a really long time. And I'm so pleased to be up here telling you about a long overdue win. And I'm going to hand it back to Dan. Cool. Sounds good. Um, so let me start off by getting some insight from you on to after your magical Facebook posts, which I'm sure you all had. How did, how did the coalition get kicked off? How did things get started for all of you? Um, OK, I can start. So uh, at first, literally, we were just a big group of internet strangers. Um, we actually didn't meet in person for two months, but we had a work plan. Um, and we were trying to figure out you know, what makes a good redistricting policy. We divided up into different committees. but. Um, and then we started talking to a lot of the groups that had previously existed in the state who all had on their website that they were looking to end gerrymandering. Um, when I started attending the meetings with a lot of those traditional groups, um, it, I noticed that there wasn't really a place for regular people. Um, if you had a membership, you could be there. Um, or if you were already kind of in the insiders club, you could. And, you know, I think it just isn't very common that a group of internet folks really do exist and they are doing a lot of hard work um, outside of the internet. Uh, and that's where I think our coalition building a lot of different groups in Michigan, I think we learned a lot together um, from this experience. Uh, we were able to kind of, we, uh, and I think we talk about policy next, but um, we wanted to start with, okay, where do we have common ground and what do the people of Michigan want? One of our core values was always, you know, we really want to craft a constitutional amendment for and by the people of our state, but that means all people, and it means uh, being able to go to different parts of the state, even if there isn't a big city there, and to be able to, to partner with people. So um, we really had to prove ourselves. Uh, we continued to grow, and we really had to keep our heads down. Everybody, you know, was skeptical, I think a little rightfully so, that uh, we had as many people as we did, or that we were making as much progress. So after we were able to gather the signatures, we had to gather 315 1,654 uh, registered Michigan voters in 180 days. We ended up gathering over 425,000 in 110 days without any paid signatures, which was really exciting. We got them from all 83 counties in Michigan. Um, that really was the first point where I think people saw that, you know, there is a built up frustration. The people of Michigan really, really do want this. And that's where a lot of our coalition building then was able to start, um, where we were able to get on the same page about, you know, how are we going to make sure that this passes, um, during the policy creation too, though, making sure that we took the time to go and meet with lots of groups and bring a lot of different types of people together was really key to making sure that we could later down the road have a successful coalition, especially when you have organizations like Common Cause and the League of Women Voters who have national principles or the Sierra Club have national principles that they are looking for in a redistricting policy. Um, being respectful of that and also having conversations about where are the people of Michigan at, where are different organizations at was really, really key. I described a, a, a lot of, of how our coalition uh, came together in my opening remarks. What I would also tell you is we had sort of a Noah's Ark approach once we agreed on the, the compromise in, in Colorado. And by that, I mean the, the idea was that there were going to be um, Republicans and Democrats and unaffiliateds along for the ride at every stage. So we had um, a Republican attorney helping to draft the language and a Democratic attorney. I'm a, a Democratic firm uh, in terms of um, campaign management. We hired a Republican firm and we worked um, side by side. We also had a history um, of doing some of that work previously. And I think um, in a lot of states, that's important, right? You can't just go in and solve gerrymandering first. Um, and so in Colorado, one of the things that we had done in 2016, uh, we ran two initiatives. One was to uh, eliminate the caucuses for our presidential uh, primary nominating process and instead have a presidential primary. And then the second was to open all primary elections to unaffiliated voters. And there was some calculus in that. We understood that moving forward uh, at that time, w if we wanted to enact other reforms, it was critical that we get that largest group, that 39% that of Colorado voters who are unaffiliated, involved in the process in a way where we could say to our friends on the um, both sides of the aisle, 
you need to think about the entire state. And if you don't, you run the risk of upsetting that great middle who now have an opportunity to participate to pr participate in your primary process. So having done that groundwork beforehand set us in motion for having success uh, as, a, as a coalition uh, moving forward. And again, having um, you know Republicans and Democrats, we'll talk about the structures a little bit more as we move on, and I'll, I'll go a little bit deeper into that. But um, we really thought about the entire state um, throughout the process, not just the Denver metropolitan area, which has about 90% of the population of Colorado, but all four corners uh, of our state. So uh, in Missouri, our coalition work was uh, more organizationally based than the, the Michigan experience. So um, we, you know, there, there's trade-offs to that, um, but, and, and that's, that's part of our story. So it started with, you know, a relatively small number of groups, and then we essentially had conversations with anyone that we thought would listen over uh, the full year and a half when signature gathering and coalition building was happening before we got to the electoral piece. Um, I would say, a big reason why that coalition work ended up being successful is that we'd put in the time and work with some of the experts in this room, um, looking at model policy from other places to make sure that um, what we were putting forward was the best possible policy we could for Missouri, and that there was no um, there was no catch, right? So it, there's just an extraordinary amount of distrust on this. Like we've come back to this and. Uh, uh, on any policy, especially when it comes to power and how power is allocated and, and what power will be like in the future. Um, I think there are a couple of moments that I think about uh, often in, there were, there were key moments in, in how we ended up being successful in bringing on more conservative supporters. Um, I come out of progressive organizing and progressive activism. And so like some of these endorsers that we were trying to went over, like they knew who I was, I knew who they were for sure. Um, uh, we've been on the opposite side of things in the past, but um, there was one state senator with whom, like we would talk regularly and often, um, phone calls he would be going to from the Capitol, you know, he's got three and a half hours to kill um, in between his home and the, and the Capitol. And so we would go line by line through the policy um, and thinking through uh, like scenarios, like what happens this, like is this a place for where Democrats wanna go, you know, run some sort of scam or like, what is this? And so we like, the good news is that we didn't have anything to hide, right? And so we did go line by line. Um, and conversations like that were how we were able to build uh, that trust. Um, that's how we were able to build the support to get endorsements from newspapers in towns big and small, not just the big metro areas, right? Like they're every bit as skeptical as, um, as other voters are of what's the catch and um, uh, voters are primed to feel like somebody's trying to scam them, and so we were able to to, to win them over because we'd done the work early on, and because we put in the miles and, and the hours. Um, so when I first got involved with redistricting reform, our coalition was you know the League of Women Voters, and we had Common Cause, and we had Ohio Citizen Action and the Bar Association. And we mostly were just talking with one another. You know, we did some educational outreach, but as you might imagine, you know, we knew that there was a lot that we needed to do to keep things moving. And so over time, you know, we've had different names. We were the Ohio Campaign for Accountable Redistricting. Yeah, you, it, that's quite the mouthful, right? Um, we were Draw the Line Ohio. And um, so, so one of the things that I feel really good about things that we did that, was, that were really useful, useful as a coalition. So in 2009, we did what I think of as an intellectual ex exercise. We used the 2000 data and we encouraged people to participate in a redistricting competition just to, so that you could, you could educate people about what it's like and because we did this kind of competition that was just kind of, hey, you know, it's not for this year, it's not, you know, this is just us having a conversation about what map making could be like and what you could actually do with your communities. It led to during 2011, we had a real competition so that during the map making, citizens were able to come and provide maps and to participate in a really truly different way. And that educational process really made a, tre made a tremendous difference. Um, we, um, we, what I think of as like um, barnstorming with maps, if you want to call it that. We went all over the state, you know, talking about maps and talking about the injustice. We also did this thing, our coalition did um, in 2011, 
where we did a public records request, and Ohio has really good sunshine law. And so we were able to discover that, in fact, um, they had used... Um, they had used um, uh, a bunker. They, they called the hotel room the bunker where they drew the lines. We understood that they'd actually move lines for campaign contributors. We saw the partisan indexing. Um, all of this helped lead the reform on. And so, yeah, we started as a bunch of wonky folks, right? But by the time we got to 2014, 15, and 16, and 17, um, folks from all over were coming and getting engaged. And I think the reason I put the pictures behind was just to give you a sense that, you know, we became not just a bunch of wonks, but we also became just you know, normal moms and dads, people that um, had retired and were like, what should I do next? Um, my favorite pictures, as I think about uh, that, I, I get stuck with people putting signs on bikes, riding around, telling people about gerrymandering. And I really think that's what we need. It needs to become part of a conversation in a truly different way. And I do not know that this would have happened if we had not had a um, resurgence in interest in the democratic principles. And, like, and by that small d, um, we have an unusual president. Um, and this has led a lot of people to say, hey, you know, we need to think about the kinds of things that make us a representative democracy. And I can't just, you know, hang out and go to the movies and um, hang out and go to a basketball game. I have to be thinking differently about these things. So the thing that was exciting about our coalition is um, we went from people that were just in here to people that were thinking with their hearts. Um, cool. So I want to get into a little bit what, um, how you came about the the policy, uh, how you came to the policy you decided to run with. Um, there are a lot of different approaches, a lot of menu of options around the country for how to implement redistricting reform, and some things fit the politics of the state better than others. So I'm just curious to know how that process went of arriving at a policy to to champion. Um, so ours was kind of multi-pronged. Um, for the core organizing group, uh, you know, part of the problem with redistricting that we had saw, seen was that uh, these decisions that impact 10 years of elections at a time are made behind closed doors by a small group of people. And for our policy committee, we had a small group of, again, internet strangers who had been meeting. They were being very thoughtful, looking at every state that had anything that wasn't politicians drawing the lines. Uh, but when I was thinking about it, I was like, you know, this is still somewhat exclusive, even if it's not on purpose, even if we're letting anybody join who wants to. So why don't we just go and put a call out and see who wants to come and help or have a say? So when we announced that we were doing the campaign, we... Uh, had these this concept called a town hall where we would go and we would talk to people about what is redistricting or gerrymandering what does it look like in michigan what does it look like in states that don't have politicians drawing the lines and what do you want it to look like in the future do you like it do you don't or don't you uh we had a political scientist who actually designed this really comprehensive survey that people would take after these town halls and during them that asked them their preferences and help think through not only who should be on a commission that draws these lines, but what kind of criteria, how do you define your community, what is the parts of the, the status quo that you really don't like or that you're okay with. Um, and that actually, we started with eight of those planned, but as soon as we announced it, we had people calling from across the state. And we very purposely started in very rural parts of the state where normally campaigns don't go because we were hearing from the people in the Facebook group that you know they continuously don't even see their representatives. So we ended up having 33 of these town halls in 33 days. We had thousands of people show up. Uh, the first one was in very, uh, if you're familiar with Michigan, the Upper Peninsula, middle of winter, and it was standing room only, 70 people there in a town that maybe only has a couple thousand that live there. It was that's when I really knew like we are on to something. And at those we'd have conversations between people about what is this and what do people want. And we also talked about the opportunity to join our policy committee. Our policy committee had a birthing doula on it, had a veterinarian, a garbage lady, which is me, um, a stay-at-home parents, and a lot of lawyers, lots of different lawyers, uh, plenty of lawyers. Um, 
But <laughs> what we learned and saw is that, you know, when people are being really thoughtful about something, you can go and research case law in other states. Um, you know, if you're a brain surgeon, you know how to read things. Um, and you can go and read redistricting law, even if it's not your expertise. And as long as you have those checks and balances, a lot of different voices can come to the table. And the really cool part was because so many of us aren't normally in the room where it happens, you felt so like you were doing something that mattered and it really brought out the best in people because you know you really felt the sense of like what we are doing if we are successful is going to amend our constitution which will impact every single election from here until they change it again which is very powerful and we wanted to be really thoughtful and intentional about it everything we did out in open out in the open so the other two prongs of this though is we actually had Kathy uh, Thing from Common Cause yeah woo oh there you are uh, California who as I was saying we were having a little bit of trouble with the coalition building piece because we were such a random group so she actually really helped us uh, make sure we were engaging with all the different stakeholder groups who had been working in Michigan for decades and got made sure we took intentional time to get all the concerns out on the table to meet. And we had Michael Lee from the Brennan Center who came into our policy committee to really act as like a facilitator for making these different decisions as we walked through the policy so that no one person from our group could use their own bias to try and sway that conversation. By setting up a facilitated style, taking all the survey data that we got from people and inviting people in it we were able to build a policy relatively quickly but with a lot of buy-in it ended up being very comprehensive but taking the time to do that led to a really strong groundwork of people who uh, wanted to be volunteers and who wanted to donate as well um, and one part of Michigan Sandusky I actually had people come up afterwards saying you know no political campaigns ever come here before. Here's a check for $200. I don't know why you're here, strange person, but talking to me. Uh, but we really appreciate it, and we can't wait to see what happens next. And I think the authenticity of being there and taking the time to engage is really what helped lay the groundwork, that even when people tried to come back later talking about bias, um, when you do things in your own transparent way, it's really hard to make anything stick as an attack against it. So the, the framework um, for our measures was, was essentially what were the goals that each group had. And um, so when we came in and independent commissions were, you know, a, a common goal, that was sort of an easy one um, for us to check. Um, but then we wanted to make sure that, that those independent commissions were truly independent. Right, that they couldn't just be stacked with the, the best Republican map drawers or the best Democratic map drawers or that the unaffiliated voters were, weren't wolves in sheep's clothing. And so we had to get pretty complicated in terms of how are we picking uh, the members of these independent commissions. And so um, there each is 12 members. The first six are essentially selected through after an application process. There is a prohibition on um, lobbyists, campaign employees, and elected officials uh, from, imply, uh, from applying. There are requirements that you have been a member of a party for at least five years or that you have been unaffiliated for at least five years. Um, and all of that is intended to get you know the best people who are not uh, party hacks, uh, and, I, and I say that lovingly as a party hack, um, uh, onto the commission. But then we also wanted the commission to look like Colorado. And by that I mean we didn't want it to be 12 white men. We wanted it to be men, women, African Americans, Latinos, people from the urban area, people from rural areas, people from uh, every congressional district. Um, and so we, that's why we had to do the second six uh, for the independent commission through a process that's very complicated, which is essentially overseen by three retired judges who then have to uh, uh, review the pool of applicants and unanimously agree on the final six as they place them at, with the guidance that the panel should look like uh, Colorado demographically and geographically. So that's, that, that's really complicated. It's, it's, a, it's an art as much as it is a, a social science in, in terms of doing that. Then we also had places where um, each side of the, in the newly formed coalition had some issues that were important to them. Um, my Republican friends, it was important for them that maps in the future not be drawn by a judge behind closed doors, that any, any map um, be drawn out in the open, that if there was a failure on the committee uh, to agree on, on a map, 
that there be a default map. Um, and, and that turned out to be sort of a, a little bit of a carrot uh, approach uh, moving forward so that lawmakers don't just say, hey, we'll take our chances with that Democratic appointed judge uh, that he'll pick our maps, but that, that they understand now, if we don't agree on a map, Map number three, uh, which has been through you, you know, the sausage making process and is constitutional and, and will stand up in court, is the de facto map. So that was something that was important. Um, they wanted, my Republican friends wanted to make sure that we respected as much as possible county, city, and town boundaries, which is, uh, becomes more important uh, for rural communities especially. It's a little harder to do in highly populated urban areas. And then on the Democratic side, we wanted to make sure that we were protecting minority communities, that we were preserving communities of interest. We wanted to make sure that there was uh, um, unprecedented transparency uh, and the ability for the public to participate, to monitor, and to weigh in. We didn't want maps to be submitted one day and voted uh, on, uh, on the same day. So there's a 72-hour rule in terms of when a map can be submitted and when it can be voted on. We've got a requirement that there be at least three meetings in each congressional district, a requirement that all meetings be broadcast over the web, um, that all public comment be posted uh, to the website. So we agreed on our goals. People had their, 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 their set recipe, but then we were able to find that common ground and, and really come up with a proposal that works, uh, we think, really well for Colorado. So in Missouri, we've had a commission, um, but it is a commission that has, in large part, been designed to fail or does its work in secret, um, in part because it's made up entirely of partisan party hacks. So the application process in Missouri is the Missouri Democratic Party selects a list of people and provides those names to the governor. And then the Missouri Republican Party picks a list of people and provides those to the governor. And the governor has to pick from those two lists. And so those commissions have been made up of lobbyists, future and former politicians, people who run campaigns, um, labor leaders, um, local political folks who just want to like go be in the mix. But they are there to provide a vote. Um, uh, and so it's not a great system. Um, and it's also a system that in, in many ways was designed to deadlock and not provide a map. And so then we get the situation of it gets drawn by judges with absolutely no transparency. Um, and you know you hear rumors about you know what's happening behind closed doors and all that. But like you just get a map. Um, and sometimes our judges would draw maps that were actually unconstitutional. So it was just a stupid process that um, wasn't very transparent, um, was driven by hacks and um, partisans and, and lobbyists, and where the end result was a series of maps where there was no competition to speak of. So on the maps that we've got right now in Missouri, for instance, more than 90% of our elections have been uh, one-sided affairs, so not even functionally competitive. A full half of our legislative races have had only one major party candidate on the ballot. And so when that's your situation and when that's your reality, you have zero ability as an activist, as a community leader, as a local mayor, to vote your bum out, to ever get them to change their mind if they're only worried about a partisan primary and they've got four or five donors to keep happy, um, or four or five interest groups to keep happy. Um, and so people have been living in this world and thinking about solutions for a while. Um, and so we started what eventually became Amendment 1. I started talking with, there was a, a proposal that happened in the 2016 cycle that um, was filed. Signatures were never collected, uh, but it was a framework that was there. And so I started working in 2016 um, with uh, talking to, like, when we started this, I think we probably had similar experiences in that we didn't know that people got together on weekends and talked about gerrymandering and thought about, like, arcane subjects like this. So we just would call anyone who we thought might listen of, hey, so how can we make this better? What are, like, the best criteria? And so the 2018 version, what became Amendment 1, had like we added really strong race equity language uh, based on conversations and talking to experts and, and uh, best practices from around the country. Um, we improved the formula and the criteria to ensure partisan fairness um, by adding, you know, the efficiency gap is uh, a standard that is in the Missouri Constitution right now. Um, we added requirements for competition and, and cleaned up some of that language. So the policy development happened uh, over a number of years from, from different folks, um, but then also took advantage of the expertise that's out there of folks who fight racial gerrymandering, uh, partisan gerrymandering around the country. Uh, so when we started in 1981, um, we focused on compactness and an independent commission. 
we lost. Um, and then 2005, we focused on competition and independent commission. And that went down. Um, and then we got to 2012, we focused on independent commission. We focused on three things, um, compactness, keeping communities together, meaning keeping counties together, um, uh, competitiveness, um, and that you know shouldn't draw a district map to favor or disfavor one political party. So that went down. Um, we. We it was a long struggle, and so one of the things that I would say is, our proposal gets at the worst aspects of gerrymandering, but we didn't leave with an independent commission. What we have is a bipartisan commission, with really strong rules, and um, this was it was hard. It was a hard thing to swallow. It took a long time for people to process and to think about what they wanted. Some of the policy decisions that we focused on might not work for others for every state. And so, for example, um, we have a rule that focuses on keeping counties together. Now we're a home rule state, um, so I was listening. Uh, you know, the the panel, the, uh, North Carolina, where local communities don't get to make as many decisions, but we're a home rule state. Um, we were counties before we were a state. Um, and then because we have lots of little cities all over Ohio, keeping those counties together actually protects communities and protects representation. So that was a goal that like just simply saying, hey, keep our counties together and don't have districts that go, you know, along Lake Erie from Toledo to Cleveland, just that is a major improvement. Then we focused on transparency because, you know, um, not that going into a hotel to create a map is problematic on its face, but keeping people out is really a problem. And so the way that we address transparency, obviously we said, okay, we need to have hearings and we need to have hearings between the time, you know, you can't just drop a map. But we also said we need everybody to be given the tools so that citizens can make maps. And that they have, you know, that there, there is in fact in place, you know, a way that we can have a much more participatory map making. Um, and then, you know, we have um, slightly different for, for you know, House, uh, for, for the U.S. House and for our state legislature. State legislature, it's the Ohio Redistricting Commission, which is bipartisan. Our state legislature did not want to give up map making. They just did not want it. You know, it's in the U.S. Constitution. They did not want to give it up. Um, and so, you know, our compromise is a little weird. Um, and, you know, we are going to see how this works. But basically, um, there's a, a requirement for a majority of both political parties in the state house um, to, to actually come together to do maps. Now, I have to tell you, this is an experiment, right? I'm not exactly sure how this will come together, but with those counties being kept together, the rules of transparency, the rules that you can't draw district lines to favor or disfavor one political party or candidate, those kinds of things should mitigate the worst aspects of, ger of gerrymandering. Um, and I can't wait until we get to 2021, 2022 to see what actually happens. It may be like tax code where every few years we need to come up with something new and mitigate it. But clearly, we as Ohioans are having a conversation about what's the best way to do this. On that, I'll hand it back to Dan. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to ask one more question on the panel, and then we'll, we'll move into some audience questions. So... Um, just a, a quick piece on messaging. You know, this is an issue in which, at least at the elected official level, people tend to retreat into their partisan corners. So um, how did you approach messaging the, your reform to ensure that voters didn't follow suit? So uh, one big thing with even just, you know, redistricting, gerrymandering, even though there were a lot of us who apparently did know about it, the majority of people in our state still didn't. And uh, the way I like going back to it is nobody's happy with the state of politics right now. You talk to anybody on the street and you say, oh, do you like the direction of the government? And even if they might like one or two people who are elected, really, it's a pretty shared American value that we are not pleased with our government. Um, and starting the conversation there with, okay, if you're not happy, did you actually know there's something we can do about it? We used a lot of visuals. Redistricting is a very visual um, 
uh, type of campaign. So on the back of each of our clipboards, we had the local district, whether it was the state house, state senate, or the congressional districts, whichever one would resonate most closely with the people locally. And by keeping the message around, you know, showing, like, do you think these were drawn fairly, or do you see why, you know, a politician might have self-interest here? No matter where we were at, no matter whose political affiliation we were with, we really got a lot of buy-in there. Um, from the nonpartisan piece in Michigan in particular, especially with the League of Women Voters uh, lawsuit uncovering a lot of really uh, crazy uh, statements, such as uh, they were trying to shove all the Democrat voting garbage into as few of districts as possible. I mean, you're calling voters garbage, but we never went into attacking one party or the other because we needed voters across the aisle to... Um, Support And when you start labeling things as Democrat or Republican doing this or that, people have their self-identity, even if you're talking about the politicians. In Michigan, because we're a purple state, too, it kind of lended itself well that Democrats and Republicans have both gerrymandered the state. So I was always very quick to bring that up. But by choosing language that didn't demonize either side and by always bringing it back to voters we were able to really keep a nonpartisan strong message our name voters not politicians also really lended itself well uh, i can't count the number of interviews where i said we believe that voters and not politicians should draw the lines keeps it pretty simple and keeping a voter focused message resonates between democrat voters republicans and independents everybody wants politicians in office doing their job focused on delivering for the voters and gerrymandering does not not make it so that they do. Yeah, I think our primary message was one that we saw used in just about every state, and that was that voters should choose their politicians, not the other way around. And that's an incredible conversation starter, right? Because it's immediately met with sort of nods of agreement that, well, yeah, that's how our democracy works, right? And then you explain to people how the, how the system as currently constructed actually works. And then it's a fairness argument. And we win when the conversation is about fairness. Similar um, uh, to, to, to Michigan, because we ended up having uh, referred measures from the legislature um, we didn't go after the parties, and um, we didn't make uh, the issue of whether or not Colorado's districts are gerrymandered um, front and center in our campaign. We focused on um, fairness and what would create the best government for Colorado. And, and Colorado has a history of voters expecting, regardless of the party, um, people to get along, to do what's in the best interest of the state, and we were able to capitalize on that. Um, and all of our messaging, sort of whether it was around transparency, whether it was around not having judges draw maps uh, in secret, whether it was around making sure that there was geographic and demographic representation, it all got back to that simple message of voters choosing their politicians, not the other way around. Um, we did significant uh, message testing, um, which is, is, if you've got the money, is in incredible, um, because you understand we had a different messaging triangle for our Republican targets than we did for our Democratic tri um, targets. Um, we were able to see, you know, I, I thought, as, as somebody who's got a, got a history on um, editorial boards, um, that the competitiveness uh, component of our legislation would be really popular with voters. It was one of the least popular things um, that we had in there. Voters were just more interested in creating a system that was fair, open, transparent, and put the best interests of the state uh, forward. Yeah, I don't have a ton to add. I mean, these are themes. Um, this is how you build a uh, bipartisan coalition, um, fairness, competition, transparency. That's how, those are, those are universal values. Uh, so our coalition at the very end was called Fair Districts Equal Fair Elections. And that just really got, that was our primary message, that whole idea that, um, let's say we all decided to ditch and go to a basketball game. We would want to have, you know, we want to have fair rules. That in fact, if, if we believe in rules when it comes to things like basketball and football, and we believe in competition when it comes to those kinds of things, well, we should also believe in that when it comes to our elections. Um, and then we focused a lot on the notion of, of sunlight and citizen participation. That in fact, you know, we all deserve to have a voice. We all deserve to um, have representation that reflects our communities. Um, and, and that at the end of the day, um, we, had, we had a ton of things that were like, what's wrong with this picture? 
Um, so we would just have a, you know, uh, we would have a congressional district map. So Jim Jordan's looks like a duck. So the people in Jim Jordan's district actually had T-shirts that had Jim Jordan's duck district. Um, and then, oh, Marcy Captures district goes from t some, uh, Toledo to Cleveland, and it's like this snake the snake along the lake, and um, if anybody who knows Ohio, the mistake along the lake is something that people are very familiar with. So the snake along. Oh, and then we had these T-shirts that were um, the LeBron district. So the LeBron district went from Cleveland to Akron because you know LeBron is from Akron. Anyway, so we um, the visuals were always really important um, because at at some point you need people to quickly get oh oh yeah it's not fair oh that's really not fair. Thank you, Dan. Great. Yeah, uh, so we've got about uh, five minutes. Maybe we can do kind of a lightning round if anybody in the audience has any questions. We have a um, Ke Keisha's on microphone duty here, or we we'll go here and then back there. Oh, okay. Oh, let's go ahead. Good morning. Uh, thank you for doing this. Uh, I I struggle with how to reach people with this message in rural communities and, and what steps have you taken to, to make that outreach? So I'd say go there. Um, if there's any way that you can go there and, and ask people and bring them into a room and, and talk about these topics, um, it might feel, myself personally, not even being in politics for a very long time, I felt like I was the only one in my friend and family group who actually cared about the world or why things were happening. But that was so wrong. Um, and thankfully, through a Facebook post, I figured out there were a lot of people upset about it. But one of the biggest things I can say is if you show up, you organize the meeting, figure out where the free library meeting is, try and get some local people on the ground to come with you. That's a huge piece. Um, but I do think that, you know, a entire state is gerrymandered. We like finding the craziest looking districts and talking about it, but we all know the map is drawn fully gerrymandered and having that conversation and making sure you make it localized, even if rural maps maybe are larger because there's less population there, you've got to do it and they will know the local areas um, where there's manipulation going on. And so making sure you have the tools to support that is good too. I, I think th three things. Um, one is to uh, identify and engage uh, local validators um, from the outset. And so we were able to not Curtis from Denver going to speak to a group in Grand Junction, but somebody with deep roots in Grand Junction um, speaking to his or her uh, peers. And, and that was critical for us. Two was identifying um, the messaging that worked uh, for specific audiences and using that message messaging through those validators. And then we had a highly targeted campaign. And so we understood that the message and the audience that we were speaking to in Denver was very different uh, to the, the messages that we would use in the more rural areas. We used highly targeted uh, mail, highly targeted digital. We used a lot of rural radio uh, and then cable TV to make sure that we were the, the right audience was getting the, the right messenger. And I, I was going to say, um, we uh, Mercer County, which is on the Indiana border, is a, I don't know, how, I mean, I can't tell you how many people are there, but it is very, very rural. And it is divided into three congressional districts. And so folks in that area were very, very interested and really organized themselves. But it did come to, um, when it comes to thinking about the entire state, especially if you have a large state, um, it, it's a, it is a, an incredible amount of work. And, and I think I started this with like, you know, that people move at the speed of trust. It's just an incredible amount of work, and it's work not just when it comes to redistricting that we need to do. We need to better understand our neighbors that we don't see on a regular basis, but that are part of our community, part of our state. And I encourage all of us to do as much travel as we possibly can to identify those messengers. Uh, we've only got a couple minutes, so I'm going to uh, just ask one final question. When you're Old and gray, telling the story of this great uh, democracy movement you were part of. Is there is there one moment, one feeling uh, that'll sort of remain crystal clear from this experience? 
I can go first. Um, so we got challenged up through the Michigan Supreme Court. Uh, I can't tell you how many people told me, oh, we're for sure getting thrown off. This is after a year and a half of everybody putting their lives on hold, um, dedicating well over 40 hours a week, every single week towards on top of day jobs and whatever else, um, towards trying to amend our constitution. And, uh, and this news story had come out too, that one of the justices, she's a Republican justice who was up for election for the first time, had been getting threats from the party that she was going to not be renominated for election if she voted to keep us on the ballot. Um, and uh, it's a five Republican to two Democrat Supreme Court. Um, and all day, uh, it was the last day of session in court. We hadn't heard. It's like literally 10 p.m. on a Tuesday, uh, last day of court. We know it's coming out, you know, seeing that it went past five, we're all convinced, like, uh oh, what does that mean? There's thousands of us on a Facebook group, like, trying to, like, sing songs to, like, keep our spirit alive that maybe we're still going to be on the ballot. And uh, I found out from our Twitter that we had won the case. Uh, I thought like maybe one of our lawyers would call me or like, I don't know, the, the, the Supreme Court, I don't know how it works. And I just started screaming um, as well as everybody else in my living room. And then because we were a digital campaign, everybody popped up on their Facebook Lives or whatever to all be recording their reactions and just seeing how joyous we all were. And the one thing that we really couldn't control working out anyways, that, that people did their jobs and reviewed the law. They didn't make decisions based on politics. It was so refreshing and just what you hope democracy is. And then to feel that and to have that security. I mean, it was a really long battle still after that Supreme Court case, but that's when we knew we were going to win because uh, we were on the ballot and we believed in the people of Michigan. And I will never forget that moment. There um, were many, obviously, memorable moments. I think for me, um, we initially thought we were going to have to go and gather signatures. Um, we decided to go to the legislature uh, as just sort of a matter of course. But when we did, we made the decision to, to enact a pretty aggressive lobbying campaign. Um, and our measures were referred to um, state affairs, which is known as the Kill Committee. It also deals with elections issues. But in my history in Colorado, um, the Kill Committee had always been a, 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 a miserable place. And to walk out of uh, that committee hearing, uh, having had the Republican uh, Senate president testify in favor of the bill, the Democratic House Speaker testify in front of uh, that referred measure, and to get a unanimous vote uh, was, was really, to me, when I knew hey, we're on to something here, and uh, great things will happen for us uh, come November. So I will remember the corner I was standing on in St. Louis when our lawyer called. Um, I'll remember some of the endorsement meetings where an unusual ally said, yeah, I think this is great. And we were like, oh my god, this is going to happen. But the, the moment that I keep coming back to is uh, we, we turned in 340,000 signatures, and uh, those all have to be validated by local election authorities. And so we were monitoring that the numbers coming back every day. And I was a nervous wreck. And I remember driving around one morning, it was Friday, it was a Friday morning, and I was convinced that it was somehow gonna fall apart, even though all the numbers were coming back. I was like, okay, what the, the math is wrong. And so I was I'd convinced myself I need to go rebuild my spreadsheet for like the sixth time. <laughs> and then the Secretary of State office called, and after losing a few initiative petition campaigns and coming up short, like just that hey, you made the ballot was um, a pretty amazing moment after, you know, literally like more than a year of work. So that's the, the moment I keep coming back to. So, good. so uh, the moment that I will mostly remember was, um, are you all familiar with Arnold Schwarzenegger? He just he described um, uh, gerrymandering as as more popular than herpes. Um, he also is just you know this tremendous advocate for a, you know taking on gerrymandering, um, and he also does this thing called the Arnold the Arnold. So at the Arnold, um, it's a bunch of bodybuilders. Um, and we were invited to go to talk to people about gerrymandering at, at the Arnold. And, um, and uh, Arnold Schwarzenegger said, healthy bodies, healthy democracy. Um, and so as I think about, as I think about that, um, that time period, we had um, all of these wonderful advocates with their clipboards and handing out information um, surrounded by some, sh shall we say, some very hunky men. <laughs> and I will always remember that. <laughs>
feels like an appropriate note to finish on. Thank you our, uh, to our panelists for your hard work and for telling your story.